What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Wrestling with Jonas. This is episode 74, and this is a special episode, uh, an inter interview with episode, and I'll introduce uh, who that interview is with very, very soon. Uh, first of all, I just want to give you our social media plugs so you know where to get in touch with me, where to get in touch with this show if you choose to do so. You can find us on Twitter, first of all. Uh, just simply find uh, us on Twitter at withjonas underscore pod. That's at withjonas underscore pod. We're on Instagram as well. Just go out and search us, Wrestling with Jonas, of course, and we've got our uh, fun interactive friendly uh facebook community group just search wrestling with jonas and that's jonas spelled j-o-h-n-e-r-s and of course if you enjoy listening to the podcast please don't forget to hit the subscribe button uh so that you can be notified every time a new episode drops so uh now when i started watching professional wrestling in the early 90s there was two distinctive voices that i remember uh remember introducing all of the wrestling shows on my tv at that time one was the great howard finkel and the other one was the very distinctive voice of my guest today he's been described as the world's most dangerous ring announcer and i'd like to introduce mm -hmm. to the wrestling with jonas podcast uh the great gary michael capetta so gary thank you for coming on the wrestling with jonas podcast how are you sir it's my pleasure i'm i'm terrific thank you yeah, well, it's uh, great to have you on the podcast. Uh, we do like doing our interviews here. Uh, and we've had a lot of interest in the interview uh, from our Facebook followers and our Twitter followers. So I can't wait to share this with them. Uh, my first question to you is uh, about the, the current products. Now, I know that you are fairly up to date on the current product. You do watch a lot of the current product. Uh, you're you're uh, familiar with a lot of the promotions, a lot of the names. But um, are there any promotions or wrestlers at the moment that, that are catching your eye that particularly have your interest? And uh, the second part of that question is, uh, have you been able to catch any of the AEW Dynamite or NWA Power? Um, so what, what are your thoughts on the current products and some of the newer shows that are out there at the moment, Gary? Well, what I think is, um, if you're a wrestling fan today, there has to be a product out there for you. There, um, anyone that says um, that puts all of wrestling under one big tent and says, eh, it's not like it used to be. They're um, misinformed, they're ignorant, or they just want to get stuck in the past. Uh, I'm not one of these old guys who, who would say everything in the past was terrific and um, um, and everything today, you know, stinks. I mean, that's, I, n I have never said that, but today with the um, advent of um, NXT and, um, AEW, I mean, it's just, it, it is amazing, you know, all the different products that you have. I mean, if, you, if you're a raw SmackDown kind of person who likes um, sometimes illogical, silly yeah. skits uh, in between real good wrestling, there you go. If you, um, you know, and, 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 and it gives you the big feel. Um, what Vinny's going for there is a, a festival feel. Um, in the past, you would um, you'd buy your ticket, you you take your seat, you watch what was going on in the ring, and you individually would respond emotionally to it. Today, that's not allowed. <laughs> that's not allowed. You, everybody has to chant the same thing. Um, to me, I, that that makes it less interesting as a fan. Uh, I think it would make it less interesting as a performer that everyone is programmed to say the same thing, to make the same gesture. It's a festival concert kind of feel. Yeah. But some people like that. So you've got that. Now AEW comes, uh, comes along and there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, I've been learning who Darby Allen is. And in fact, I didn't even know who I shouldn't admit this, but I didn't even know who Sean Spears was from WWE because there was yeah. a chunk of time when I didn't watch WWE. And I guess he was, you know, he was there at the time. Um, yeah, he, he wasn't uh, used very well or very much on our TV. So uh, even people might not have been too familiar with his character on WWE, to be honest with you. But he's getting a, a better push and a better rubber of things on uh, AEW by the looks of things. But yeah, he's an interesting character, one to watch. So if you're, if you're interested in, it, it's a little bit uh, less conventional. If you're into flyers, if it doesn't bother you that the competitors are an average of 175 pounds, um, um, if you um, want to educate yourself and find out who these folks are, um, there you go. You have that product. 
Mm. Um, now, if you're really old school these days, you have NWA power. Well, there so, you go. Yeah, that, that's been uh, a revelation on, on YouTube and on their Facebook channel. I've seen both episodes. I've been very impressed. And it, it kind of takes you back to the, the studio show days, probably uh, when the, the smaller promotions, the territory era was in uh, full swing and a lot of their shows were studio shows. So do, do you get that same sort of vibe? Yes, absolutely. And um, um, if, if I was starting a promotion today, um, AEW is, is, is a bit different because it's owned by a billionaire. <laughs> so, you know, with network connections. So it's amazing how they entered the game and became number two. I mean, it's just amazing. They didn't have to work their way up. They've only been on, um, on you know, broadcasting for three weeks with their, with their series. Correct. And the product appears, and it is, as technically, um, you know, will technically wow you as SmackDown and, and Raw does. Yeah, the presentation is great. But if I was on a limited budget, which most folks are, um, I would never try to emulate what WWE does. I would, I would provide an alternative because other than the billionaire with network connections, mm -hmm. you, no one can approach that. Um, like even like I go to indie shows from time to time and everybody is trying to do their cheap version <laughs> of WWE. I would never do it. You would never see an, an entrance way with lights and some tinsel hanging that a guy stumbles through. It would never happen. You know, I would make the, I would, for instance, I would make the railings that really narrow. Um, I would, um, you have to play music these days, so that's, you yeah. know, the music would be okay. I would probably just darken the arena and have spotlights and, and, and spotlight the guy coming to the ring as he's surrounded, engulfed by wrestling fans. Yeah. I don't know whether you've ever seen the old school Madison Square Garden. Absolutely, uh, yeah. You know, the Vince Sr. thing. You know, it was a small rampway with, I would have put a security guard on either side of the guy or gal. And I wouldn't try to, to pretend that I was WWE. It's just silly. It's just silly. So NWA Power um, takes an entirely different route, and they've been really successful. And in their first, uh, I guess, two two weeks or so. Correct. And uh, you know, I it's it's great. It's 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 fun to watch. Not to mention New Japan, Ring of Honor, Impact, MLW. If, if you can't find something in, in that array of products, then, the, then you know, I'm sorry, but you, you, you lost. Might as well not be a wrestling fan. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. You're, you're not. Yeah. But uh, it re we are sport for choice as far as the amount of promotions, the variety out there. And uh, each one tries to give a, a different presentation, a different offering to the fans. And I think that uh, if, if you're not a big fan of what WWF offer on Raw and SmackDown, and you prefer the NXTs or something a little bit more independent, then you do have the choice out there. And just about all of them kind of uh, are accessible online. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, they're, they're such a, yeah. an amazing array. And going back to kind of when you were growing up, when you were a fan, I'm guessing that you, you managed to watch quite a bit of wrestling in the New Jersey area. And w w did you watch much wrestling live, uh, kind of in arenas? Uh, and if so, what sort of promotions or what sort of uh, wrestlers were you kind of a fan of back then? You didn't have a choice. There was only one promotion. It was WWWF. It was right. Vince McMahon Sr. So... Um, that is that is one of the reasons why in the part the northeastern part of the United States where um, I've always lived, um, I had an advantage once I started to announce because there was no other place to announce other announcers, other referees, other wrestlers. They didn't exist. There was no place for them to work. There were no outlaw shows. So. Um, I was only exposed to, you know, to the to the one product when I was a kid. Um, I, just to back up a second from what we began talking about in the current products, mm. one of the reasons when I do my uh, I have a, a subscribers page on Facebook that people um, subscribe to and and I do uh, some editorials. I put some old old school Super Eight uh, footage of classic wrestling matches and do interviews, things like that, things that aren't on my free page. 
And um, one of the one of the reasons that I come across as most um, uh, I come down hardest on the WWE is because everybody copies the WWE. Like we talked about the entrance way. Yeah. Well, there's no difference. Like in the ring, what they do in the ring is copy. So it has a huge influence on the industry, not just for today and tomorrow, but for the decade. I mean, people are still chanting what? How many years ago was that? You know, oh. that Steve Austin? I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yes. So when I see something, and it'll be the same thing with AEW, because AEW is, you know, is, is a major league, you know, right off the bat. When I see something that doesn't make sense, I'm going to scream out about it because while you have your your range of, of wrestling, there still has to remain some semblance of what it is. In other words, when the two or four people are in the ring, they're trying to win a match. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so a lot of times that's lost on on the performer, you know, the performers are just there to do some kind of spectacular spot in order to get a quick reaction. And when they do things that are illogical towards actually winning a match, I'll scream. Yeah. Or yeah, something that's... like, um, and I'm, I'm happy to see AEW pick this up. I don't know whether anyone there watches my rants or whatever. But I'm sure, they do. I, I'm sure I've caught a few, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether you remember, um, it was a few ring of honor pay-per-views ago and the main event was a one hour draw but yeah. they never announced a time limit for the match they never the commentators never said oh we're getting you know they've, they've been wrestling you know 50 minutes we only have 10 minutes left yeah. it the match just stopped so you always if you're ever going to have a time limit draw you always have to announce a time limit and you can't just announce a time limit for those matches that are going all the way because that's stupid. Yeah. So if you notice AEW, they announced time limits for every match. It it it, and then we had Cody and Darby Allen go the full. I think it was uh, twenty or thirty minutes. It it creates everything we used to do creates um, an effect, an emotional effect. So for a time limit. When you're coming close to the end of that time limit, as a fan, your heart's supposed to start pumping. And, and the crowd is supposed to get a little bit more feverish and feverish because we're running out of time and I want my guy to win. The same reason why we had tag ropes. It, it kills me that they don't tag hand to hand. It is not a tag in when a guy tags another guy's chest or shoulder or back. Correct. It was a reason because there was there was an emotional pull about trying to reach fingertips. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, there are, there are reasons for all these things, Absolutely. and and when they get thrown to the side, you're losing another tool, another technique to draw your fans in. Mm. Gary, so I'm, not, uh, I'm no, ranting. I apologize. No. You carry on ranting that that's what we're here for. But you you started in the in the kind of the full range of the business at quite a young age. You was an editor for a wrestling magazine. I'm quite intrigued by this. Now it was the, the Ring uh, magazine, wasn't it? And I remember reading the Ring back in the 90s. I think it was still going then. Uh, but how did you get introduced to the the magazine industry? And how did you fall into it at such a young age? Because I think you were about 21 when you became an editor of that magazine, and that obviously gave you uh, kind of a window to the world of professional wrestling. Gave you a bit of access. To some professional wrestlers on the, uh, the the East Coast. So tell me a little bit about that time period. Well, I wasn't an editor. I was uh, I simply wrote articles. Okay. Um, I went to their editorial um, office in New York City, and and uh, I was a senior in college, and I just I asked them for a press pass, and I talked them into giving me a press pass. So that allowed me to get into the match for free. And I only wrote uh, two or three articles. There was one on um, Gorilla Monsoon. There was one on um, Midget Women Wrestlers. And there may have been another one before I started announcing. 
and then I, I stopped writing. So, um, yeah, that was a short period, but it was important because it got me closer to the action, not backstage. I mean, you would never, ever, ever get close to a, a wrestling dressing room if you weren't right. a wrestler. Okay, yeah. Never. So, so you, 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 you did an article on Gorilla Monsoon. Is, is that how he kind of uh, became familiar with you? Because I understand that it was Gorilla Monsoon that gave you your, your first um, opportunity as a ring announcer um, for, for the, uh, for the uh, states that he used to book for, uh, part of the WWF back in the 70s. So uh, how, did you, how did you build that connection with Gorilla Monsoon and uh, how did you uh, eventually fall into being a ring announcer, Gary? I don't. I don't believe he would have remembered me from the time that I interviewed him. Mm. Um, but because I was writing for the magazine, I was at ringside one night. They didn't have um, a ring announcer. Um, I volunteered just because the matches were. Uh, the, the promoter would would walk up to the to the ring and you know at the end of every match and and announce the winner. And it was just making the night drag. So I'm saying, yeah, this is like a waste of time. So when he came up one time, I said to him, if you'd like, I, you know, I'll, I'll sit here and, and just give me the microphone and I'll introduce the guys and I'll announce who, you know, who wins. And um, <clears throat> he said, sure. So um, at the end of the night, he asked me if I had any experience. And uh, true to all great beginning stories in wrestling, I lied to him. <laughs> and I said, of course I do. Sure. He said, we'll come back next week, wear a tie, we'll put you in the ring. I had no idea what I was doing. Not a clue. And, in fact, I didn't even wear a tie the next week. I carried the suit with me because I didn't want to be um, embarrassed. You know, like who would go to sit in the, you know, in the bleachers of a wrestling show, you know, with a, with a suit on. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and that's how Monsoon, he was wrestling at the time. He was also part owner of WWWF. And um, he had a, a piece of the WWWF geographically carved out where he promoted shows. And um, he eventually asked me if I wanted to. Um, I didn't even know he was a part owner. I just thought he was a wrestler. That's that's how I knew him. Um, and, you know, he asked me if I wanted to continue with him. So mm -hmm. I did. And then I found out he was a producer of WWWF TV. And after I got my, um, I was broken in for two years, working at all kinds of local high schools, colleges, rodeo arenas, CD clubs, um, all kinds of auditoriums, convention halls, um, military bases. After two years of that, he asked me if I wanted to start doing the TV with him. Yeah, WFTV. And I was going to ask you about that. I mean, just after two years, you, you, you were the main or the one of the lead ring announcers on their prime TV show. So they're, they're syndicated TV shows on a weekly basis. You would have been, what, only about 24 at the time. Uh, how, did, how did you feel about, you know, the, it was moving so fast. You're at such a young age, you were taking on extra responsibilities. And now on TV for the WWF at the age of 24. I mean, that must have been mind blowing at the time. It was, it was because it was a very powerful show. And, um, you know, people would recognize me in public, even though I was only like physically seen for maybe uh, 45 seconds, you know, an hour. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't do any kind of close ups on the uh, on the ring announcer. And and Vinny, who was the commentator um, for the show, never said my name. So I did introduce myself in the very beginning of every hour. And if people go to the WWE Network, they can see the old all-star wrestling shows and, and see exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, it was very heady because um, I, I actually had some negative experiences from uh, the public just from the notoriety of that show. So it was a mixed bag, but mm. it was, you're right, it was an incredible uh, opportunity. Mm. So I was I mean, with them for 11 years. Yeah, well, I was going to say, you were with them for 11 years, from 74 through to 85, and you were there, you were present during the reign, the championship reign of superstar Billy Graham, Bruno Sammartino, second reign, Bob, Black, Bob Backlund's lengthy reign, as well as the rise of Hulk Hogan through to his first title reign. Uh, but what, Morales. 
Yeah, Pedro Morales. Yeah. I mean, what were some of the fondest moments and memories of those 11 years being with the WWF and the WWF as it changed eventually? Uh, so, uh, you know, you worked, you must have worked alongside some of wrestling's greatest personalities in that 11 years, Gary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, my greatest memories are, the, are actually of um, doing the ring announcing because that was not my full-time occupation. I was uh, teaching school, yeah. so I would, at the end of a school day, um, I would take off and, you know, I, I was, think about this, this was just one small part of the WWF territory, and I was mm -hmm. working, I was announcing an average of three times a week. Three times a week is a lot for uh, <laughs> never traveling, <laughs> you know, they were always drivable, I would always, you know, drive to them after teaching. So my, my greatest memories are, you know, what would happen in the ring when George Steele would attack me or Jimmy Snooker would attack me or I got knocked out once at the Spectrum by Iron Mike Sharp. And, you know, those are the kinds of things that uh, body slammed by, by The Rock's grandfather. <laughs> Boy, am I dating myself? I chief Peter Maivia. Yeah, um, yeah. So I didn't have much in the way of interaction other than with Monsoon and a couple of the other guys. I didn't have much uh, social interaction with uh, the wrestling community. Yeah. So, so if you don't mind me t asking you this question, I mean, you, you had a dispute with uh, with Vinny, with uh, Vince Jr. that led to your departure in 85. Now, I'm aware that Vince around that time was in the midst of taking over all the territories on his quest for nationwide and worldwide dominance. Uh, but uh, I, I'm interested to know, you know what your working relationship was with Vince. I mean, you've just explained that you didn't mm -hmm. have a lot of personal relationships with a lot of the, the staff there. Um, but um, what was it that what were the circumstances that led to you leaving? in the WWF in 85 then, Gary? Right. I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, characterize it as, I forget how you did characterize it. Well, like we didn't have any kind of, um, like there was no dispute. argument. No. There was no dispute. There's nothing to dispute over. He was the boss and I wasn't. Oh. <laughs> there was, you know, there was nothing to, um, he was very impersonal. He was very cocky. He was, he's, he was pretty much like he is, his character is today on TV. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that he was in his early thirties and I was in my mid twenties. Um, in the 11 years that I worked for them, um, you know, he, he never had, he never, we never had a conversation. Mm. He actually acknowledged my presence maybe three times in the 11 years. And one time, <laughs> one of those times was to fire me <laughs> from, from a, an arena, not from, not totally. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, you know, when I look back, um, because I had another career, I believe that he knew that he couldn't control me financially. So there, because the WWF, and by the time I left WWF, um, announcing was not the majority of my income. Um, and I, I think that he felt if he couldn't control your purse strings, if he couldn't, you know, financially, that he didn't have your loyalty. Mm. which was a big uh, mischaracterization on his part because sure. I loved what I was doing so much that, it, I mean, obviously it wasn't for the money. Yeah. And the other thing is, is that at the time he had a, now we can use the word dispute with Gorilla Monsoon because when McMahon took over all of the promotion from his father, he forced the minor stockholders to sell their shares so Monsoon lost his part ownership. They had, Monsoon, I'd never seen him so angry, you know, mm -hmm. for a period of time. Of course, they became very close again later. But um, when it was happening, I was on Team Monsoon. I wasn't on Team McMahon because Monsoon mm -hmm. brought me to the dance. That was another reason that I think he, he felt he couldn't trust me. But to answer your, so with that, with that in mind, I knew I didn't have a future with them. Now, remember, you couldn't predict the success that they were going to have. It was a wrestling company. That's all it was. And you combine that, that situation with Vern Gagne offering me uh, uh, my first national broadcast on ESPN. First time, uh, I believe it was the first time pro wrestling was ever on a legit sports network. Yeah. So 
you know, being in a lane that I knew was going to come to a dead end and having an opportunity that looked like, you know, that, that it had a future. I just stopped working. I didn't quit. I wasn't fired. I just stopped showing up. By this time, I wasn't doing their TV because they uh, they were doing their TV elsewhere, and I was teaching. So um, uh, Howard was doing their TV at the time. Yeah. So, so you, you continued doing announcing even after the WWF. You, you mentioned about AEW there, uh, AWA. Um, yes. And, and then you also did a bit of work for Jim Crockett for his uh, NWA promotion. And then it became more of a, 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 a full-time role for you, became a permanent fixture of NWA. Uh, I suppose it would have been WCW by the time you joined them at around September 89. Um, so I know that you were doing a, a bit of uh, some jobs for NWA until September 89. And that was when you became a regular fixture. Is that correct, Gary? Yeah, I, I worked with Jim Crockett Promotions regularly in certain cities mm, that's right once again in the northeast close to where i live so i would do whenever they there were not many arenas that they could get into because uh, mcmahon had um exclusive deals with the arenas that he had worked with like madison square garden for years and years and years and no one was allowed into those arenas there were a couple like in baltimore and the meadowlands arena in new jersey where um, Jim Crockett Promotions did get in. And so I started working, for instance, monthly for him in, uh, in Baltimore. And so they got to, to see my work. They started calling me in to do their pay-per-views. Remember, those were on weekends, so I, it was easy for me to get to them. Um, yeah, they would just fly me out on the weekends. And I, and I was also doing Vern Gagne's couple of his pay-per-views. Yeah. So, so I was a free agent. Yeah. Mm. But then when you became full time with WCW back in uh, 1989, it was such an exciting time. There's a lot of transition going on with the company. I think that uh, Ted Turner had just taken over from uh, Jim Crockett Promotions the year before, turned it into WCW. Um, Ric Flair had just had his clash classic trilogy of matches with Ricky Steamboat. He was then feuded with Terry Funk around this time. Sting was becoming their biggest babyface. Luger was red hot. You had a fantastic tag team division around that time as well with the Steiners, Road Warriors, Road Warriors. Birds, 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 Doom, uh, the Midnight Express, and so many others coming through. How did you adapt to joining WCW during this very exciting period with all them top names uh, under their under their brand? Well, after 15 years of working in the sport part time, 1989, that period that you're referring to with WCW, mm -hmm. was the first time that I worked full time, and it was the first time I quit teaching. And um, I, I had an, a contract, full-time contract with WCW. Um, and I, I would have never done it if it wasn't um, a, a, um, a, a large media company, yeah. Turner Broadcasting. Um, for instance, I, you know, if Vern Gagne had asked me, or probably even Jim Crockett had asked me, if I would work full-time with them, I probably would not have quit a very secure position that I had. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I actually had a leave of absence from my teaching job so that if WCW didn't work out, I had a, a job waiting for me in a year. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it was a very exciting time. I loved working, uh, you know, I had a really good deal, so I had no complaints on that side and I enjoyed, I, you know, I enjoyed working with everyone that I, all of the, um, until Eric Bischoff came aboard. Even those that sometimes get a bad rap, like Ole Anderson, he was in charge at a certain point. Bill Watts was in charge at a certain point. Jim Hurt, which uh, he always gets, a, he really just, of anyone, he deserves his bad rap. But I got along with them all and seemed to be able to please, you know, what they were looking for in a ring announcer. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was heaven for me. I was with WCW for six years. Yeah. And when you look back, back at that time, so the late 80s and early 90s, uh, you must look back at it as a bit of a golden age, really, in, in terms of professional wrestling and WCW in particular, um, who, who back then appeared to have one of the best talent rosters uh, in all of pro wrestling. I mean, some of the names that I mentioned earlier, including uh, newcomers like Brian Pillman coming through the ranks and so mm -hmm. many others. It was such a, an amazing time in pro wrestling. And of course, WCW, WCW was portrayed as the more serious uh, professional wrestling company, whereas WWF might have been considered considered more for gimmicks and characters, but uh, WCW really had the athletes and a hell of a roster around that time. 
Yeah, I mean, it, when I went from um, WWF to the NWA before WCW, I, I was like, <laughs> I had never been exposed to the product, and I was just stunned. It was like, you know, from Hogan to Flair, it was like going from ballet to back, you know, backyard street fights. It's like <laughs> I had never seen anything so violent, you know, portrayed live before. Um, and um, yeah, because they just worked a lot lighter in the WWF and in in NWA, they, they you know they 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 really landed them in and they laid them in, and there, there was no. Um, it had a feel to it that WWF just uh, couldn't duplicate or didn't mm. duplicate at least. Yeah. But also around that time, I mean, many of its stars started to leave and go to the WWF. I mean, you had Mark Calloway, for example, leave in 1990, Flair left in 91, Luger left in 92. Uh, how much of an impact did that have or did some of them departures have on WCW when one big name seemed to leave after another? And were there any concerned people backstage? Yeah, a lot of concerned people. It's, um, you know, um, everybody thinks about job security. Mm -hmm. And when you have your top stars taking off and you see um, dissent within the ranks of the promotion in which, you know, you you work every day. Um, sure. I mean, it, it's, you know, there's going to be concern. You know, in, in my position, I had absolutely no power or say in what went on. So, um, you know, I didn't let it get to me. I just enjoyed what I had for the time. Um, the other thing it allowed, when I was with uh, doing the WWWF TV, it was shown in different parts of the world. But when I was with WCW, it was the first time that I had an opportunity to travel to different parts of the world. So it was, you know, we did the, um, I think it was called the Raw Power Tour in England. Um, I remember um, I did a few tours that brought me through the UK um, because yes. in London, at different times, we worked different venues. Um, the first time, the Olympia? Is That's that right. In it's London, all... London, Olympia, correct. And then the next time we were at Royal Albert Hall. Yeah. And then I think the last time that I was, you know, there – on tour, it was Wembley Arena. So, I yeah. mean, that was, those were exciting times. You know, Sheffield, Manchester, um, Dublin, um, Aberdeen, um, Belfast, and then Germany. And we yes. toured Germany extensively. Um, because we had WCW a, was huge in in Germany because it had the uh, the TV deal there. I think it was on RTL yes. um, and was was huge. And in fact, to be honest with you, that was how a lot of people in the UK had exposure to WCW and a lot of the pay per views that they couldn't watch in the UK would would be via the the German satellite channels that they would see via RTL, for example. The kids used to um, the kids in uh, the the British kids used to call me Gotti Gotti. <laughs> I, it was great. It was wonderful. Um, it, it was it was a first opportunity where it really hits you as to the um, the reach and the impact of what you're doing. You know, as you're as you're broadcasting, you're just you know thinking about getting the job done as best you can, and you don't realize even in in my minor role on the broadcast um, the influence that you could have on different people. Um, mm. I had because part of part of my effectiveness back in the day was that I looked so regular <laughs> and that I was short and I you know I looked like someone who's sitting in the third row to make everyone around me look bigger and stranger crazier you know more was superlative so a lot of people uh, related to me I had a uh, I had a young man come up to me at um a WrestleCon during WrestleMania weekend. And he said to me that when he saw me announce in the middle of 20,000 people, that it gave him confidence, like to stand up in front of his classroom to give a report. Because if he can, if that Gary Michael Capetti can do it, I can do it. You know, that kind of thing. It's, it's, that's amazing. Yeah. It is amazing, especially yeah. when you consider the minor role that I played. 
So, so Gary, you mentioned Gary, earlier that you did a few tours of the UK and you went to Wembley Arena. Was that mm. was that part of the Hulkamania tour when Hulk Hogan had just joined uh, WCW? Yes. Ah, because yes. I was at that one. I, I was uh, I was there in person at Wembley Arena for that show. So, uh, but that that was a good show. You had uh, stunning Steve Austin before he came became Stone Cold, of course. You still had uh, you still had Surfer Sting. Uh, you had Hulk Hogan. Uh, Vader was there. I think he fought the Guardian Angel, formerly Big uh, Big Boss Man, of course. So, uh, yeah, all the all the big guns were brought out then, and that was a good show. I remember that one fondly. We were brought. Uh, I, we were in heaven because we were brought to the UK by. Um, the promoter was Barry Clayman Concerts. Mm. I don't know whether Barry Clayman is still in business with concerts or not. But at the okay. time, he he was. Is he? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't. I oh, remember oh, okay. his name from back in the day, but I don't know if he's still uh, still right. Right to know it. Yeah. You know, he was doing uh, you know uh, Michael Jackson, and and I remember that on this tour, we always followed Gary Glitter. <laughs> Gary Glitter was in the arena like the night or two before us. So we were chasing him around, you know, around on tour. I didn't know who Gary Glitter was at the time, but um, I do, you know, obviously I remember that name. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, that was exciting. It was, uh, I, I love traveling um, overseas. It was, it was a blast. Well, I'm sure that uh, whenever you travel to, to Germany, to Europe in general, or the UK, you were treated like superstars. I mean, I, I went to a lot of live shows, uh, at WCW when you were in town, but mostly WWF. And uh, yeah, the wrestlers were treated like superstars. They would be you know, chased outside of their hotel and they would uh, people would be hanging outside, waiting outside the arenas for autographs and for any sort of photo opportunities. So, you know, we, we really loved it when the American wrestling companies came over to the UK. Yes, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get an audience with the Queen, no, but yeah. I did see the Queen's box at Royal Albert Hall. Yes, and um, we were treated very well by the beef eaters. <laughs> that, that's I don't good. Know that's more. good. Yeah, I guess that's good. I mean, it's, it's it's better than not being liked by the beef eaters, I suppose. Yeah, and right. um, they, can, they can get pretty nasty when when you upset them. I, I understand. <laughs> probably good that I didn't know that. I would have been nervous. <laughs> and they they got us into. Um, and I'm, I'm not ever going to remember the name of the club, but a private gaming club, a very um, um, upscale, but uh, mm. like a lot of the casinos in the, in the States are kind of cheesy, you know, with all the, you know, the flashing lights and, and bright colors. This wasn't like that at all. This was like real, like business, business. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I just, you know, sat there and, um, a very modest, you know, betting very modestly, and on uh, I forget what I was playing, but um, and I won. I wound up winning like a few bucks, so it was there fun. We go. It all counts. Um, uh, the next question is, you know, we've spoken about the amazing talent from around that time period, the early 90s. However, it wasn't all good, uh, which brings me to a listener question. I've got a question from one of our Facebook followers, uh, Gary. Uh, it's from a, a, a Facebook follower called uh, Ashley Clement. And Ashley asks, uh, what were your thoughts on the Chamber of Horrors match from Halloween 1991? So just to bring our listeners up to date, that was the match involving Sting, the Steiners and El Gigante versus the Diamond Stud, who we may know better as uh, Razor Ramon or Scott Hall, Big Van Vader, Cactus Jack and Abdullah the Butcher. Uh, now on paper, this match uh, you know, had a lot of star power, but the bizarre conclusion to this cage match was when Abdullah uh, was strapped to an electric chair to end the match. Uh, and that was something that uh, hasn't been looked back on very fondly. But how do you remember <laughs> to, answer, to answer Ashley's question there? Yeah, but you know what? They like that better than RoboCop. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. When I do my stage show and I, I go on tour, you know, these days, um, inevitably, you know, someone will bring RoboCop up. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wasn't hypercritical of our own product. I would just, you know, always just hope for the best and think about it. I'm the face of the promotion. I'm the one person that's uh, from the television show that people have access to because I stay out at ringside the whole night. I usually will stay after the show ends and talk to people and sign autographs or whatever. So um, I have to stay up and positive about what we're doing. And, you know, if, if it was, um, and unless it was an event where something happened that, like, that was dangerous or that was just dumb. Like, do you remember the, the night that um, it was a Halloween Havoc 
when the uh, the ring decorations went on fire and Dude, the yeah. great Muda like um, scaled the the ropes and I don't think he had mist but he maybe he did have mist I don't know but he blew the the fe- the you know the uh, the fire out do you remember that I, I do vaguely I can't remember which year though but uh, yes I do you know so as someone who works for the company I just you know shrug my shoulders and say how stupid can they be you know they bring in these set designers without realizing how high, hot the lights are and then I you know you just move on because you have to because I have to stay buoyant I have to stay positive I have to give that rousing introduction and it has to come from my heart or it's not going to work so I couldn't I couldn't uh, dwell in negativity so, so Gary, one wrestler that you'll always be associated with is uh, WCW legend Sting. Uh, simply for the fact and for the way that you introduced him, uh, instead of just simply saying "This is Sting" or "Sting," you would announce him as "This is Sting" uh, so yeah. in, in quite a unique way. So you kind of brought an extra element to his ring entrance and really made it extra special. Um, but that was a very unique and memorable introduction to this day. And how did you kind of come up with that uh, ring introduction in particular? How did it all uh, kind of uh, initiate? for yourself for someone like myself who um i boom you know it's just if i don't have a microphone i boom mm. so sting is very difficult to boom because it's a closed vocal mm. and i needed uh like a little bit of of a, a, a run before i jumped <laughs> because every time i said sting i didn't know whether it was actually going to come out or not so therefore i had to create something a couple of words that I could say to warm up to get to the sting. And so I just started, I made that up. This is sting. And um, unlike today where everything is so scripted, mm. I, I, I could never work in that environment. I would create my own introductions. Um, if there was a message that the promotion wanted me to deliver to, to a crowd outside of the regular ring introductions, I would say to them, tell me what it is that you want to communicate. And if they were to give me a script, and at times that happened in WCW, I would say, okay, that's fine. But I'm not using this script. Like, this is not a ring announcer's voice. It's not my voice. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, the, the job will get done. The people will understand, you know, but I'm, I have to do it my way. It's like I, I have a personal connection with the crowd, and this is very impersonal. This is a press release. It's not a ring introduction, a ring announcement. Yeah. So well, I, just, um, I, I just want you to know that that so the way you introduced thing, is, I remember it as clear um, today as I did 20, 30 years ago. So uh, that, that that was a uh, very good and credit to yourself there. But which other wrestlers uh, did you really enjoy announcing to the ring because of their name, uh, how the name sounded, or um, how you'd be allowed to put everything into their introductions? And uh, have you ever had any input from wrestlers about uh, how they would like to be introduced? Um, well, no, the, the first time that I work with a wrestler, I'll ask them, mm. um, you know, where are you from? What do you weigh? That, that's something that um, that annoys me a little bit today where, um, um, you know, there's there sometimes the, their weight and their place are not announced. It's like they're a circus act. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like they're a, a, a sporting competitor. And I'll tell you something else <laughs> about like the, the women's revolution. If, if the women want to be equal, can we please start announcing their weights? I agree. Yeah. What was the big deal about that? Mm. So are we equal or are we not equal? Mm. Other, than, other than Nia Jax, yeah. I don't think that, you know, the weights have been announced. No. Um, and that was wrong. Yeah, that was wrong the way they did that to Nia Jax. That was just to draw attention to the fact that she was a bigger wrestler. Um, but, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, they, they should do it for the female wrestlers. It, I agree with your sentiments 100% there, yeah. And one thing that I, that I do like that WWE does, two things within their company as far as introductions. Um, most times when I see a championship match, they wait for both participants to get into the ring. The referee holds the belt overhead. And then the introductions happen. They're not they're not happening during the during the entrance. Mm. I like that. It adds. I mean, if if you want to add some kind of seriousness, sporting seriousness to the event, that's what you do. Mm. The other thing is, I like uh, on the new NXT show. I think it's really cool 
I guess it's for their championship matches where they darken the arena and they have the white spots. I think that it just sets that match apart as it should be. Yeah, it makes it special. It really does. So uh, d- during my research, Gary, I learned that you, uh, you're you a man of many hats, or you certainly were in WCW. Not only were you the world's most dangerous announcer, but you also helped to produce segments backstage, and you even helped to uh, commentate or announce for their Spanish language programs. So tell me a little bit more about these extra responsibilities that you had whilst you were working for WCW. As much as I, I love doing what I do, um, and and what people would see on TV was only part of what I did, even with my ring announcing. Um, I would come out in advance of the cameras rolling to talk to the people, you know, get them up, get them warmed up. Um, and when we go to commercial, I talk to them and keep them, you know, vibrant so that when we came back from commercial, you know, it was an exciting event. Um, probably, I think, the more, although it didn't happen as often, the more important thing was when something went wrong. If there was a wrestler who who was a main event wrestler that didn't show, mm. and I, you know, someone needed to break the news to the people, like the the on YouTube thing has gone viral. I can't tell you how many millions of viewers it's had. Was the night that I announced that Ric Flair wasn't going to be at the show, and that he was no longer with WCW and he was no longer champion. Wow. <laughs> so there was a certain way to do that. Um, that that's an example of don't give me a press release. I'll give them the ring announcement. Yeah. Um, and and one of the th- one of the things that you do is you never, if it's bad news, you never go out and smile and prance around and say, you know, and try to minimize that. No, that sucked. Yeah. That was bad. And this is what happened, folks. And give them a chance to boo, to throw things at you, which I hope they don't do because that's dangerous. But you know, to get that out of their system and and to have, I don't say anything, but you can see the look on my face that I'm upset also. I'm on your side. I'm with you. And then I have to turn it around to give them something positive to try to get them up again. So there's a tech, you know, there's a technique to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget what your question was that led me there but no I, I think you answered it that that's absolutely fine now we, we spoke briefly earlier about uh, touring the UK touring Europe and uh, and Germany in particular now I can't have the great Gary Capetta uh, on my podcast without asking him about that fateful night in Munich March 1994 where oh. Mick Foley lost his ear in the match against Big Van Vader now uh, what can you tell me about this incident because I understand that you were ringside when this incident occurred and um, was it you who collected Mick's ear off the floor and was in possession of Mick's ear, uh, discarded ear, for, for quite a while after the incident. Tell me about that rather eerie moment. I didn't, yeah, I didn't collect it off the floor. The referee flipped it to me. Ah, well. <laughs> he actually, it actually fell off in the ring. Um, the, the, the important part about that story is that it didn't start, the story doesn't start that night. Um, for months and months and months, um, Cactus Jack, Mick Foley, had been um, wrapping his his head in the ropes night after night after night, Doing and the referee spot. would would po- try to pull the ropes apart a little bit. And every night he would go through, and his ears would get nicked little by little by little. Mm-hmm. So by the time we got to Munich, Germany, he was taping his ears down because they were already partly severed. So in this particular night, the ropes were extra tight DDA get from France was the referee didn't speak English we didn't speak French and he didn't know what this spot was and what he was supposed to do I don't know that he would have been able to pull the ropes apart because the first match that night I think it was two cold Scorpio the 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 ring ropes were floppy so he came back and said to Flair who was in charge that night he said, you know, you better tighten, get those guys to tighten the ropes. When they tighten the ropes, they over-tighten them. So that when um, when Mick Foley's head went in and he went over and, and the ropes tangled, it was extra tight. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but that's not when, it, when his ear came off. I mean, but it, it severed it a little bit more so that once he entered the ring and Vader took a shot at him, and his head went back, and then the ear came off. Wow. 
Yeah, it was it was surreal. I mean, it was you you don't know what you would do in such a situation until it happens or unless it happens. Um, if you were to say to me, if Johnny were to say to me, "Hey, Gary, here's a human ear. Would you hold it in your hand?" I you know I'd run away from you. I'd tell you you're crazy. But in the spur of the moment, I knew that for there to be any any possibility for uh, medical professionals to reattach his ear, the ear had to go on ice. I never would leave ringside, but I did that night yeah. and uh, to try to find the doctor who would have the ice. And the first person I ran into when I got back there was Flair, who said, what, what are you doing back here? <laughs> and I said, to, and, and it was very dark and you couldn't, and my hand was extended. And I said to him, Rick, I've got cactus's ear in my hand. He said, what? I said, I, I've got cactus. I didn't call him Mick at the time. It's cactus. I, I have cactus's ear in my hand. He said, are you all right? I said, I took him by the arm and I pulled him under a downlight. And he looked down and he said, damn, that's a human ear. He said, yeah, that's what I've been trying to tell you. And then the guys came out from one of the dressing rooms. I remember staying like, he was like amazed at this. And I said, guys, you know, this is all good. This is all like fun and good, but I need to go find the ice. And then I need to get back out there. <laughs> and um, Cactus Jack, Mick Foley continued the match. You know, he just had a hole in the side of his head, and he just continued the match. And um, the match ended before I got back out to the ring. And as it was a big, uh, it's a sports hall. It was a big round uh, building. And as I'm making my way in the back hallway around, here comes Foley from the ring with his hand over the side of his head. And as we're passing, I said to him, are you okay? And he just, he was, he was stunned. And he just said, bang, bang, I lost my ear. Honest wow. to God. He said that story. In, in character. And, you know, then I went out and continued the show. There we go. An amazing story. Thank you for that. But uh, you were with uh, WCW, as, as you mentioned earlier, for six years. You finished, uh, I think, your last pay-per-view was Slamboree in uh, 1995. Um, but what what were kind of your, some of your fondest memories from your six years with WCW then, Gary? You obviously did a lot with them. You travelled the world with them. Uh, you had a, a full-time position with them from 1989. So what was your, your some of your fondest your memories fondest you can look back on nowadays? The, uh, the international travel. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that was exciting. Um, the flair, this, well, this, this was a little before WCW it was more NWA, but the, the flair steamboat three matches, yeah. um, in, uh, at the Superdome in New Orleans in Chicago and, uh, Nashville. If you remember that Nashville, the last one, there were three judges sitting at ringside one of which was Terry Funk, you know, and that continued the, um, the feud going forward. But um, Pat O'Connor and Lou Thez, I mean, to, to meet these legends, these you know, legends is a very overused word these days. Um, you know, today, if you live long enough, you're <laughs> you've been out of circulation long enough, you're a legend. But I mean, these men were, you know, absolute legends. Um, to introduce my namesake, um, the world's most dangerous wrestler, Dick the Bruiser. That was cool. You know, like different isolated um, incidents. Um, you know, just just a general overall feeling of being feeling blessed to have had that opportunity. Definitely. And, and uh, at the beginning of the interview, we mentioned Gorilla Monsoon. Now, you credit Gorilla with uh, giving you your big break in wrestling back in 74 uh, for mm -hmm. being a, a bit of a mentor to you as well. Uh, but yes. who else in the wrestling business do you credit for um, for, for their guidance or for their friendship or, or, or maybe for being a bit of an inspirational figure towards you throughout your career? Um, you know, it, I put it all on Monsoon. He, he gave yeah. me, he gave me um, my start. He, um, I wouldn't say he groomed me. Like he never would. He never said to me, "Gary, that was a you know that was a good night." He may have said you did well, which is something the McMahon's would never ever ever do. Um, and not just to me, just in general, they, you know, it's their attitude is, "Well, we're paying you to do it, so you know we mm -hmm. expect we expect that." 
Um, but because of the entry that he provided and because of um, mentoring me for those first 11 years of my career, it was my, my expertise in the ring that carried me through the rest of my career. I, I mean, if, if, if through the grace of God and, you know, I was able to find other work without and people coming to me. One of the reasons that I got my WCW contract was that Jim Hurd, who was the executive vice president, the first one, um, saw me on a Vern Gagne pay-per-view, an AWA pay-per-view. And he sent word to me saying, you, you, you can't announce their pay-per-views, you announce ours. But I wasn't under contract to him. I was still teaching. So my response back to that was, well, if you expect me to sit home while I have a good opportunity to work elsewhere, and you're not willing to provide me with a, con a contract, well, you can go screw yourself because that's not going to mm. happen. Mm. And that forced him to either commit to me or to find someone else to be his ring announcer. So mm. I wouldn't have had that kind of moxie. I wouldn't have had that kind of confidence if it wasn't for the way that Monsoon um, brought me in and allowed me the experience to get good at what I was doing. I was never the, you know, I never had the best voice. I never, but I was, you know, I was, I was a good worker. I was competent. That's pretty much what I would say. Gary, one final question for you before we let you go. So now you've been busy since leaving WCW with the, the release of your book, uh, Body Slam, the, the, the memoirs of a wrestling pitch man. That was originally released in 2001. Uh, it's re-released in 2006. Now, you, you took that on the road in a very special one-man show, uh, Body Slams and Beyond, I believe it was called, which you wrote, you directed, and of course you, you were the, the one man. You, you starred in it, of course. This tour took place last year. So can you tell me a little bit about what inspired you first to to write the book and then eventually turn it into a successful one-man show well this comes from um, my education background as a, as a teacher not everybody learns the same way um, so some people are readers some people do not like to read so it was my way of communicating a lot of the stories and the information visually and through storytelling to people who wouldn't have read the book and um, it was just another presentation of uh, the information of my Body Slams book. It just made sense to me at the time. And, um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. In fact, I, I would love to bring this show to the UK. So you, you need to ask. Yeah. Yeah. You need to call up <laughs> powers that be. I mean, come on, use your influence. Get me over well, I, I might do that. There, there are quite a few uh, conventions now where we get uh, a lot of the stars from the States over uh, once or twice a year. So I might drop them an email and uh, mention your name. That would be good. Um, but uh, I was going to ask whether you were coming over to the UK. So maybe that's something that... Uh, that I, that I can look into for you but uh, Gary I just want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today for giving us your your insight in your many years of being a ring announcer for uh, promotions all over America and traveling the world and all of your wonderful stories so thank you so much for coming on the Wrestling with Jonas podcast today I appreciate it um you know and I I love getting out still and I do guest ring announcing in addition to my stage show and and appear at conventions um I've got a um a huge event coming up on uh, December 14th uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, here in the States, where we're going to celebrate the contributions to pro wrestling of beautiful Bobby Eaton. Oh, we're, we're going to uh, pay tribute to him. So I'm going to fly into uh, to Knoxville to be part of that tribute. If there's anybody in that part of the world, uh, mm -hmm. it's on uh, Saturday, December 14th. Come on out, and um, Bobby's going to be there, but he doesn't know about it. And we can wow. we we can talk about it online because Bobby doesn't have a clue about what a computer <laughs> is. I, I'm serious. I'm serious because it's being advertised all over Twitter and Facebook and so forth. That's something else. Uh, and and Bobby would he, you know he would just never know about it because he he's not you know computer literate. He could care less. Um, That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just who he is, and that's part of what makes him charming. He's just a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, yeah, also, people can visit me on Twitter at Gary Capetta. They can yep. visit me on Facebook at uh, my initials, G-M-C 
number four real, GMC for real. Um, and if you go to my page on Facebook and you click on fan subscription, you might want to get uh, hooked into that. It's only $1.25 a week. It's $4.99 a month. And um, I have a very successful Facebook page. But I save some of the more exclusive behind-the-scenes content for the subscribers page. I do interviews. I did a series of interviews with second-generation wrestlers. So like Larry Zbysko's son, Harley Race's son, um, Brian Pillman's son. Um, it was, it was uh, off of the Samoan grandson, Samu's son. <laughs> it, it, so, the, so there's some really cool content on my subscribers page on Facebook. So that's GMC for real. Um, join us. We have, a, we have a really good time. There we go. I'll definitely be giving it a look. But uh, thank you once again, Gary. Um, are there any more Thanks. plugs? Uh, I don't, your, your, your book is still available, I'm guessing. And uh, you finished touring for now, though, haven't you? Are you? Do you plan on doing any more dates around the US? I do. Um, there, uh, there are a couple of promoters who've asked me about bringing the show out. So um, nothing's finalized. But um, I haven't hit every part of the U.S., so um, this and, and I haven't been to Europe with my show, and mm. I haven't been to Canada, so I'm ready and roaring to go. I, I mean, it's it's a fun thing to do. Um, it's it's a difficult show to describe because I'm telling you stories, and as I'm telling you stories, overhead on uh, this giant screen video. So that as I'm telling you the Mick Foley story about the night he lost his ear, you're seeing it happen. There actually was a fan who had a, a camcorder that night that snuck it into the building. And I have the, you know, the entire match on, on tape. So you see where he gets his head uh, into the ropes. You see the punch from Vader. And you see the ear fall off, <laughs> off his head. I mean, so it's, it's really... Um, it's 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 a it's a fun night. It's it's educational, but in a in a fun kind of kind of way. Yeah, it sounds very interactive. But uh, that that sounds yes, it is. And we'd love to get you over here in the UK. But uh, thank you once again, Gary, and uh, yes, have yourself a, a great weekend. But uh, that does draw an end to this uh, very special interview with Gary Michael Capetta. Please keep it tuned to the Wrestling with Jonas podcast for all of your weekly NXT, NXT UK, AEW, and WWE updates. Uh, we uh, drop an episode every single Saturday, so look out for that on all popular podcast platforms. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel uh, so that you are notified every time a new episode drops thanks again to gary and thanks to everybody for listening we'll be back again uh, next saturday uh, and every saturday uh, with weekly recaps for uh, the shows that i just mentioned however in the meantime take care have yourself a good week and speak to you all soon